You're listening to Welcome to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. We are your hosts. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yu. And this is our mid-month episode for the month of March, where we'll go over new releases, book news, and a special interview with T. Bui, the author and illustrator of The Best We Could Do, the hot new graphic novel that just came out. Graphic memoir. Graphic memoir. Graphic memoir. Graphic novel. It's a memoir. It's a really dope book. You guys should check it out. Um... But before we get to that, I uh, just want to catch up with my co-host here I haven't seen in a while. I don't know. I saw you like two days ago. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. We went to watch Power Rangers. And yeah. It was super awesome. It was, it was a really surprising movie. <laughs> I, I, th- I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. 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 Um, as, a, as someone who <laughs> enjoyed Power Rangers as a child, it was definitely a blast to the past. There was a lot of fan service. So much, but it's very subtle too, like because it's, like it's original, like original series fan service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now that we got that out the out, out, of, out of the way, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's get to it. We got a bunch of new releases coming out this month um, from Asian American authors. Rira, as always, has compiled her list. So um, let's let's get through it. Let's All go right. through it. So the first book on our list is *The Bone Witch* by Rin Chupeko, and it's published by Source Books Fire. Uh, The Bone Witch follows the journey of an exiled young necromancer named T, who must learn to control her magic under the guidance of an older witch, while a war that will possibly destroy the sovereignty of her homeland brews afar. And that released on March 7th, so it's available now. Cool. More magic books. Oh, so many magic books. You have (laughs) no idea. Uh, Next up, we have Secrets and Sequences, Secret Code Number 3, by Jean Luen Yang. Oh, Jean Luen Yang. Nice. Speaking of graphic novels, um, published by First Second. Uh, release date was uh, March 7, 2017, so it's already out. It's the third volume of the Secret Code series. Hopper, Annie, and Josh continue trying to unravel the mysteries of Stately Academy, an elite institute where teachers, students, and robots work together in coding. Just when the trio thought their only problem was Professor Dean, they learned that their true enemy is a green skin coding genius named Professor One Zero. Cool. Always cool to see new stuff from Jean. Yeah, that man is always writing and drawing. Um, Next on our list is Hello Universe by Aaron Entrada Kelly. It's published by Green Willow Books. Hello Universe tells the story of a serendipitous friendship formed by three middle schoolers. There's Virgil Salinas, a shy boy living in the shadow of his boisterous family, Kaori Tanaka, a self-proclaimed psychic, and Valencia Somerset, who is ostracized at school because of her near deafness. When a bully traps Virgil and his pet guinea pig at the bottom of the well, it's up to Kauri and Valencia to find their missing friend. And that released on March 14th, so it's already out now. Cool. Um, also, also released March 14th, 2017, is Amina's Voice by Hina Khan. Um, Amina is a Pakistani-American Muslim girl struggling to stay true to her family's culture while blending in at school. When her best friend Sujin is suddenly hanging out with the cool kid in class and even starts talking about changing her name to something more American, quote unquote, Amina grapples with questions of identity and is further confused when her local mosque is vandalized. And that's that's published by Salam Reads, which is the Muslim imprint of Simon & Schuster. Nice. So this is one of their first books? or Yeah, it's one of their first books. Uh, we have another uh, book by Salam Reads that, uh, that's going to be out on March 28th, and that's The Gauntlet by Karuna Riazi. And it's being like described, it's being pitched as the Middle Eastern steampunk version of Jumanji. Okay, that's a lot of words. Yeah, um, <laughs> but uh, the book tells the story of a Bangladeshi American girl and her two friends who must defeat a mechanical board game's diabolical architect or be trapped forever. That is like Jumanji. Yeah, but with like cool steampunk elements. So nice. I'm, I'm pretty excited for that. Good for Simon and Schuster. Um, they've been making a lot of good news lately. Well, <laughs> remember uh, 
what, what was his name? Yiannopoulos? Like, what, it doesn't, like, doesn't matter. Uh, whatever, yeah. That guy. That guy. Yeah. yeah. They dropped his book. They dropped his book, and now they're churning out, like, cool Muslim YA books, so. Who Yay. knows how <laughs> corporate America works, man. But good for them. Good on them for making this imprint, and good on them for putting these books out, because they seem like they're needed in this uh Yeah, and they sound amazing, too, so. Yeah. Um, next up is A Crown of Wishes, The Star-Touched Queen Number 2, by Roshani Chokshi, um, published by St. Martin's Griffin. That's fancy. Uh, releasing March 28th, 2017. Um, the book is about Gori, the princess of Bharata, has been taken as a prisoner of war by her kingdom's enemies. Hope unexpectedly comes in the form of Vikram, the cunning prince of a neighboring land and her sworn enemy kingdom. Unsatisfied with being a mere puppet king, Vikram Vikram, 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 I think is how it's pronounced, offers Gori a chance to win back her kingdom in exchange for her battle prowess. Together, they'll have to set aside their differences and team up to win the Tournament of Wishes, a competition held in a mythical city where the Lord of Wealth promises a wish to the victor. Yeah, I read The Star Touch Queen. So it's like uh, Roshani Chalsky, she has a very lush style of prose. So if you're into like beautiful, poetic <laughs> prose, she's definitely an author that you should check out. Uh, and the last book on our list is Kokoro by Keith Yatsuhashi. And it's the sequel to uh, Kojiki. And it's published by Angry Robot, and it releases on April 4th, 2017. And it's about an exiled prince of another world who steals his kingdom's greatest weapon, a giant sentient armored suit, and uses it to open a portal to Earth where he meets a magical young woman named Keiko. Nice. Is this a novel or like it, a graphic novel? It looked novel? like a graphic novel dep- like on, on the cover, but I'm not sure. Okay. We've been tricked before. Like, I yeah. saw Heroin Complex, and I was like, oh, cool, a graphic novel. And then I picked it up, and I was like, no, it's... <laughs> I actually was tricked by the um, the book that we're going to interview the author of, um, The Best We Could Do, because I thought, oh, here's a cool memoir of, you know, and then you Vietnam refugees. It and and it's like, like, wait, oh, it's, a, yeah. it's a comic. There's, it's there's a graphic like novel. Inside. Um, another book that did that was the... Um, I forgot what it was called, but it was the the business like business memoir of the guy who started Honest, uh, Honest Tea. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's all in graphic novel form, too. Anyways, um, so those are the new releases for March and early April. Uh, We'll be back next month um, to talk about the new releases in April. But before that, we will be talking about our March pick. Right. We didn't talk about our March pick yet. Um, We're also reading a memoir. Yeah, we're reading a memoir called... When Breath Becomes Air. Okay, I was about to say the air I breathe, but that's totally different. (laughs) Um... (laughs) <laughs> That's how you know I haven't gotten the book yet. Oh my God. Um, yeah, when breath becomes air, a memoir of uh, I guess he's a brain surgeon who he's develops. Neuro- yeah, he's a neurosurgeon who uh, gets diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Mm. So it's a memoir about pretty much life and medicine and uh, just coping with just coping with cancer. I guess. Yeah, I hear it's actually a pretty breezy read. Like heavy but breezy. Heavy but breezy. See, I feel really bad. We're gonna talk about this book in like in like a week or so, and I still haven't started. <laughs> That's okay. It's not that long neither. So it's not it's, that long. It's, no. it's perfect for this short month that we have. You can finish it on time. <laughs> I could instead of the night before, like usual. Uh, but yeah, the um, when breath becomes air is our March pick. If you want to get it, you can pick it up at your local bookstore or on Amazon. Um, and make sure you read it before tuning in to our next episode, which is our discussion. Yeah. Cool. And we're also, um, as always, we're doing a live book club meeting mm-hmm. for the people who reside in L.A. and want to. Yeah. And we're, we're also going to do, are we going to try to Google Hangout again? Oh, we do have a Google Hangout. All right. We also have a Google Hangout for those of you not in L.A., but still want to come and talk. Uh, about and, the book, and you can find more, in, find out more info on uh, on the Books and Boba's Facebook page. Mm-hmm. So go and check it out, and don't forget to join our Goodreads page as well to um, stay involved with the community. Um, do we have any news this week, this month? Um, 
no, I think all the news came out last month. And okay. It just kind of covered this month. But we, I don't know. If I missed, nice. if I missed anything, please tweet us. Please. Yeah, uh, please tweet at us or um, talk to us on the Goodreads forums. Um, and if you have any hot leads or story updates or news updates, um, please um, get involved in the community. Um, we're only two people. So sometimes, you know, as much as Rira has her head in all this business, sometimes she misses things too. And um, we can always use your help. Yeah, we are so many. So <laughs> many Asian authors. Like, It's awesome. Yeah. It's great. Um, so uh, we're going to move on to the second part of this episode, which yeah. is our interview with t Bui. Yeah, so um, t Bui is the author of The Best We Could Do, which is a great book. You should check it out. Uh, we just talked to her and had a really great conversation. And here it is. And we're here with T. Bui, the author and illustrator of The Best We Could Do, a new graphic novel. That's, um, it's a memoir about her experiences as a refugee from Vietnam. Yeah. How's it going? Thanks for joining us. It's going well. Thanks for having me. Great. Um, Rira and I both really enjoyed reading your book. It's, um, I pretty much read it in one go. It's a- yeah, me too. I, I read it in one sitting. So I'm very, very excited to talk to you about the book because I absolutely cool. loved it. <laughs> So this is your debut you. debut work, right? It is, yeah. Can you tell us about um, your creative process? Like, how did you decide? Why did you decide to do it as a graphic novel? Um, I mean, did you did it, did it start as a graphic novel, or did it start as a more of a traditional memoir? Um, no, well, actually, it started as a really academic oral history project that I did for my master's thesis. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew that it wasn't going to be anything that anyone would ever read <laughs> in that form. So um, I wanted to make it more accessible, uh, and I was really inspired by some graphic novels that I had read that um, dealt with uh, history in a really personal way. But it, I, because I hadn't really done comics before, it was a really um, it was a really ambitious thing to to decide that my first <laughs> my first work in in the comics medium would be a, a full length graphic novel. Um, yep. So it, t- it took me a while. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, I like I when I read the book, I read the introduction, and uh, you said that the seed for this book began around 2002, and uh, it went through a lot of different forms. I would say a lot of different mediums. So, uh, what mm-hmm. what ultimately compelled you to tell the story in graphic novel form? Um, I like. Uh, well, okay. So first, um, like I switched from from doing sculpture and fine art to trying to look for a medium that people I knew could actually afford to buy. So I, I was really interested in, like, comics as an affordable form of art. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I, I was always getting in trouble for tr- uh, making sculpture that was too narrative <laughs> um, in my in my MFA program in sculpture. So then I figured I should just, if I, you know, clearly I want to be telling stories, so I should just, like, switch mediums and try to find the storytellers um, and uh, the cartoonists that I met were among the nicest and friendliest people um, I'd ever met in, in the art world. Um, so I, 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 I liked the people and I thought the medium had a lot of promise and there wasn't a lot of work. Like it, it wasn't a, a, a saturated um medium with like a, a lot of history that I would have to deal with. Like I felt like mm-hmm. in the art world, I had to deal with so much like art tradition. Like if you couldn't make something without somebody saying that it harkens back to like post minimalist work <laughs> from the sixties, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And I wasn't getting, I wasn't getting that in, in comics. I felt like I was more free to try something new and to um, tell a story that I felt like hadn't been told yet in the, in the comics form yeah um, that was of course until i read that was of course until i read gb trends in america mm. yeah um I, I was about to say like yeah there aren't a lot of uh graphic memoirs out there i was really surprised at uh how uh the history tied in with the personal experience in in, in the book from reading the reading the memoir um you say that you were only three years old when you emigrated from vietnam to mm-hmm. and, and immigrated to the states, um, I, like I can imagine that you had to rely not only your family's memories but also 
years and years of research. Uh, was it difficult to reconstruct the setting, shall we say, uh, in your drawings? Yeah, yeah, there was a lot of visual research that went into that for sure. Um, and a lot of just drawing things as I imagined them and then showing them to my parents and checking. Uh, so there was a lot of going back in and adding more details or changing things that I'd gotten wrong. Or actually, like, just seeing seeing their memories drawn out um, and fleshed out actually uh, helped my parents remember more things. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the rewriting was, like, adding new, new, new material all the time. That's great. Um, you know, I, I'm of the age where I'm starting to talk to my parents as well about their immigrant experiences. And, you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. always tough sometimes to get them to... Um, Remember things, and my, my parents came, you know, in less, much less dire circumstances as your your family did. But I do talk to my friends. I, I have a lot of um, a lot of my friends back, back in the San Diego Valley are Vietnamese, and they're starting to talk to their parents about the experience and learning about all the all the you know the, the harrowing stories of what it took to get to the states. Um, I imagine you must have mm-hmm. felt a lot of pressure to tell your family story just right. Um, were you nervous at all about showing any chapters to your parents? Um, I was nervous the whole way through. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I was nervous starting I, just to start the story because I, I had grown up with a lot of Vietnam War movies that were really bad, you know, mm-hmm. that, that really misrepresented Vietnamese people and, and Vietnamese experiences. Um, so like, just the idea that like now I was going to do something and I might possibly really misrepresent people was just a paralyzing fear. Um so actually, it wasn't until I became a parent myself that, like, I realized, oh, you know, you just have to jump in and do the thing that you're really scared of. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I took a risk, um, and uh, I definitely took some risks with like the some of the details that I put into the story. You know, I wasn't sure if my parents were going to be <laughs> entirely happy with all of them. Um, but I, I did show them drafts of each chapter as, as I as I drew them, and um, I like to think that they had veto power, and, <laughs> and they like to think that they they let me tell the story the way I thought it needed to be told. And um, we're still talking to each other; we we still all like each other. So, um, <laughs> How's the response been so, so that, far for from people who read your book? It's been really cool. Um, Surprising, I guess. Um, I mean, it's like the, the best possible scenario. Um, it, it's been really, really cool to to hear from Vietnamese Americans and Asian Americans and um, be told that uh, they're excited to be able to pass on like our history, our refugee history. Um, some of them are buying it for their kids, and I have to tell them it's PG thirteen. It's okay. <laughs> You know, because they, they're, it's more important to them that their kids are learning their history, and and it's, it's, it is in a in a format that's accessible to younger kids, even if they don't understand like all of the content, they're able to read the the comics. Right. Yeah. Um, so you began working on this book when you were in your twenties. You said it was uh, like your thesis project, and mm-hmm. now you're a parent yourself. Um, so I'm curious, how has your perspective on your parents' stories changed during the writing process? Um, I gained a lot of empathy, and mm-hmm. I didn't actually start drawing the the story until I became a parent. And I was I had just had my son, and I would draw the pages while he was snapping when he was a baby. Um, uh, I think that if I had done the story all when I was younger, I would have done it through the perspective of the kid, but having that extra perspective of like how hard it is to, to be a parent and how easy it is to mess up as a parent, um, I had a lot more empathy for my parents and I was a lot more curious about, um, just them as people before they became my parents. Yeah, um, like I found your work to be very candid. Um, Not everyone is perfect in in your memoir. And I'm sure it must have been very difficult to strike that balance of telling an honest story as well as protecting protecting your family, I guess. Was that difficult, striking that balance? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, there's, there's definitely stuff that you don't really tell people, like, just in a social context, because it's just not cool. <laughs> it could be a little awkward. 
Um, but I think like when you tell a story, it, it can be, a, it, it's very see-through when people aren't, you know, portrayed as whole human beings, and that means with their warts and all. Um, but I think that it's relatable because uh, we're all imperfect. Um, and so, I don't know. I know that it can be difficult in in Vietnamese American families to um, talk about some of the issues, but I, I don't think that like my story is is special at all. I think that a lot of this stuff is very common, but really hard to talk about. So if I can be like the the thing that you sort of put on the table, so that we can open up some some conversations that are hard to have, I'm I'm happy to do that. Yeah, and what I really loved about the book is a lot of stuff that happens is really terrible. You know, people lose family members they never see again. But then throughout the entire story, it ends up on a very hopeful note about just discovering who you are through your through your family and through your past. And I think it's really it's we're always encouraging people to just find out more about the stories because our parents' generation, especially, and our grandparents, they're starting to get, get up there in age. And, you know, you, you want to, yeah. these are stories that you want to, you know, they're part of the American experience, at least our American experience, and we want to yeah, you know, and, preserve those. And unfortunately, they're not really taught in American yeah. American history classes. I, like, uh, I remember in high school, I didn't really get the Vietnam War um, history from like a refugee's perspective. So I was mm-hmm. like, I, I felt really grateful reading, reading the book because mm-hmm. it was a lot of history that I didn't know about. And um, I thought it brought something new to the, I guess, American narrative of the Vietnam War. Yeah. Yeah. I was reading, I think, I think it was in the New York times like last week or something. Somebody wrote about the Vietnam novel, like as a, as a genre <laughs> and like all of the authors that they named were like white men. <laughs> <laughs> it was really amazing. I'm like, Oh, it's, this is still happening. Um, and it's like, I remember in high school, I think I was taught history chronologically, and then, like, they always ran out of time at the end of the year. The <laughs> Vietnam War would sort of be, like, stuffed in there with civil rights and, and other 20th century stuff. And so I, I don't remember even actually studying it. I think I just sort of, like, read it as homework <laughs> one night. Right. And for a lot of us, that segment, that short segment at the end of American history is our history, really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So your book is coming out at a time where it's actually super relevant with, you know, things <laughs> like immigration and, um, and refugees. Um, what, do you hope, um, yeah. what do you hope your readers um, can take away from reading about you and your family's experience? <laughs> well, it depends on who's reading my book, right? So if it's like other <laughs> liberal, then I don't know. I, I don't know what I have to offer them. Um, you know, I'm a, like me too, kind of. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, encouragement, oh, man. Right? yeah. Encouragement, yeah, yeah. And then I guess even with liberals, you know, like another perspective that maybe you haven't had access to, but that I have, like, lots of access to. <laughs> so here's here's what I know. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to, like, explain things. Like, I, I think, like, I've been a, a public school teacher for so long that I'm, like, I'm used to explaining things to people who don't know anything, so I, like a lot of people say, you know, it's not my job to explain like my identity to other people, but like I think I'm okay explaining. <laughs> um, and then I guess for people maybe with like very different political views than mine, um, I if, if I have anybody like that reading, I hope that they connect with with refugees as as people, as human beings, with like you know, yeah, names and values that might be very similar to theirs. Um, everybody wants, everybody just wants the best for their kids and wants a chance to like live and love and, you know, have, have an okay life. <laughs> I enjoyed reading the segments, the sections about your, your parents' childhood and just how even before, you know, the, the whole civil war, there was other things happening and the French colonial, like what the French, um, the Indochina wars had to do with your family and what ended up happening to, to the country. Um, those are all things that I think we gloss over sometimes during yeah. um, history class because it's so Western focused. Yeah. There's an oversimplification yeah. to, uh, the human cost of yeah. the human side of, yeah. Like one of the, one of the quotes that I really loved in the book was, um, 
Um, I think that a lot of Americans forget that for the Vietnamese, the war continued whether America was involved or not. And that's so true. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's something for liberals right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I also really loved how... Um, like the narrative of the book, it wasn't really linear. It it like jumped times. Um, it started like the book started with uh, you as as a character. Um, it's very becoming comic a parent, yeah. yeah, becoming a parent, <laughs> and then it goes into your parents' history, and it goes into uh, like the history of Vietnam, and it goes back into uh, um, towards like the beginning of the book. It's very like meandering, but I really enjoyed that because it wasn't just all like heavy uh war history all throughout like there was some like light moments and also um heartwarm heartwarming more moments so i really enjoyed that personally oh good i'm glad that was a struggle <laughs> to, to make it all you know go down easy yeah well congratulations on the book release um we both highly recommend it and you know for our listeners go, go check it out um it's available on amazon all bookstores now i saw a whole wall of it at the local barnes and noble here so it's it's out there okay great <laughs> um what's next for you in terms of I, you mentioned that you are you still teaching full-time or are you working on something else now um no i get to be a writer these days and that's really mm-hmm. amazing um, I'm, I'm headed to New York in a few days, um, so I'm going to, um, it's to promote the book, but I'm also tacking on a little side trip up to Cornell to interview, um, some undergrads and their two professors who took them to Vietnam in January for a climate change awareness course. Cool. Um, so my next thing that I'm jumping into that I don't know how to do, but I'll figure it out along the way is, um, is comics journalism. So I'm going to, um, research uh, how people are responding to climate change in the Mekong Delta of Vietnam, oh, wow. where um, wow. the, the, the sea is rising and it's flooding the area that, that grows half the country's rice. Um, it's killing the crops. And people have been dealing with that and drought at the same time, but they're, um, they're, they're really resilient and, and creative about how they're adjusting to it. Um, in the meantime here, we're like just thinking deeper into climate change denial. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's a really, it's a juxtaposition that like, you know, is really maddening and like really fascinating. Um, so I just want to, I've heard that people are not in climate change denial there because they, they live with it. Mm-hmm. So I want to go and, and see what it's like and find a community that I can spend some time in and, and tell their story. That sounds awesome. Yeah. I, I do have one one last question. Uh, okay. You did mention that uh, this was this was your first graphic novel, and you had to kind of jump into the unknown and kind of embrace your fear. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure learning how to do comics on your first time doing a comic is uh, <laughs> it must be very challenging. So I wanted to ask, uh, what is your advice to uh, the young um, aspiring comic writers out there? want to do something like what you did with this novel <laughs> maybe don't do what i did <laughs> um because it took 12 years um you know start on something smaller so that you can you can have the satisfaction of finishing it um but also like seek out a community i think that one of the things that sustained me or the really the thing that sustained me other than like just my own personal drive um to finish something is like having the support of other um, other cartoonists who do this all the time and being able to like email somebody and say, Hey, how do you do that thing in Photoshop, you know, with the <laughs> overlay layers or, you know, or having like a, a, a group of people who are willing to really read your work closely, like read really drafts closely and give you honest feedback. That stuff is really um, important. And, and I think that all, all comics people should try to get that in their lives, even if they're already professional and published. I think it's a really great practice, but I want to keep up. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and good luck on your next endeavor. I'm really looking forward to actually a reading or or seeing what, what comes out of that. So good luck with that. Thank you. Thank you so much.
And that was our interview with T. Bui, um, author of The Best We Could Do, out available now, wherever books are found. Um, definitely check it out. Um, I know Reaver and I both said we, we pretty much just like devour that book straight through. We're fans of graphic novels. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Like, no, not really. No, it was like weird because when we read Monstrous, uh, mm. like I wasn't sure if like our book club would be suited for graphic novels, <laughs> but like... But like a lot of members from our book club are actually really big fans of graphic novels. So yeah. um, definitely something that you should put on your to read pile. Yeah, this is this should be just required reading for like any Asian American studies class, really, because it's it's a perspective that's not often seen, but hopefully will be seen more and more now that, you know, now that Asian American creators are coming of the age where we want to tell these stories, you know, in in book form or in in film form or video form or anything. I'm looking forward to all the stories that will come out of this generation of creators. Uh, but that'll do it for this episode of Books and Boba. Uh, thanks again for listening. Again, our March pick is When Breath Becomes Air by Paul Kalanithi. You guys have about a week and a half to finish this book. You or, can do it. Or, I when it, or it. however long it takes before you play our episode. Honestly, there's... You I know, mean, that's true. That's the benefit of podcasts. It's, it's, the uh, internet is you forever. You can play it in, in your terms. But if you'd like to discuss it with us on our monthly meetup or Google Hangout, um, you do have a week. That means we have a week. We should probably get that book soon. I'm going to get it after I leave here. <laughs> I still haven't purchased it. <laughs> Don't forget, you can list, you can subscribe to Books and Boba on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and wherever podcasts are found. If you've been enjoying yourselves and our discussions, please leave us a nice rating and review on iTunes. It does help us out uh, to reach new audiences. And if you know anybody who might be interested in joining the book club, um, please share our social media, share our Twitter, share our podcast, share our Goodreads page. Um, with them so we can grow our community and on that note don't forget to join and be get involved with our goodreads forum there you can talk to other books and boba book club members help us build our list of books and you know even bring to our attention books that you're reading that might be great to check out yeah we'd love getting suggestions awesome well on that note this has been books and boba for march 2017 uh we'll see y'all next time Bye. bye This episode of Books and Boba was hosted by Marvin Yue and Rira Yu and produced and edited by Marvin Yue. For further discussion on the books covered at Books and Boba, please visit our Goodreads forum. You can find the link on our Facebook page at Books and Boba, as well as by searching for the group Books and Boba on Goodreads.com. Books and Boba is also a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a brand new collective of Asian American podcasts and podcasters. You can learn more about the collective as well as check out our founding slate of programs by visiting the website www.podcastpotluck.com. If you like books and boba, check out this other great program from the Podcast Potluck Network. I'm Brian Hu. I'm Ada Singh. And welcome to Saturday School. When your friends are watching Saturday morning cartoons, you're being forced to learn Asian American pop culture history. <laughs> <laughs>